just buffering. I'm sure it won't be long. Okay, live now. Oh, here we go. Well, uh, welcome everyone along to our council meeting on the 22nd of April, uh, 2020, still under lockdown. Um, and I know that we've got a council affirmation and a, um, and a whakatoki uh, uh, karakia, but there's also this little jingle that I've had to have been playing, uh, which is, and I thought, um, I don't know whether that's going to last beyond the lockdown, but it's been quite nice um, having something a little bit different during this time, meeting online is one of those things and reading books for our library staff to be able to share um, within our community has been something else that, that has been um, useful for. We're going to um, start with the affirmation. Let us affirm today that we as councillors will work together to serve the citizens of Selwyn District, to always use our gifts of understanding, courage, common sense, wisdom and integrity in all our discussions, dealings and decisions so that we may solve problems effectively. May we always recognise each other's values and opinions, be fair-minded and ready to listen to each other's point of view. In our dealings with each other, let us always work to be open to the truth of others and ready to seek agreement, slow to take offence and always prepared to forgive. May we always work to enhance the well-being of Selwyn District and its communities. We will. And uh, the karakia, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, kia mā ki nā ki nā ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai, e hi a kia nā te atakura, he hio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. If we look um, at the agenda for today, uh, first of all, we do have an apology from Councillor Mugford, who is unable to um, be with us today, either for the open or the um, PX um, part of today's meeting, uh, and the rest of us are all present. Is there any identification of um, any extraordinary business not currently um, held within the agenda? I was going to say, I'll move that apology be accepted, Mr Mayor. Oh, thank you, Councillor Alexander. Moved Councillor Alexander and seconded Councillor Lyle that we accept that apology. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand and declare it carried. Uh, and that was a unanimous decision. And again, today, I'll, um, when we're voting on matters, I'll run through the councillors um, voting for and voting against, uh, in case you can't uh, see at home how those decisions have been made. Uh, the only extraordinary business, not that it needs a decision, is around our meeting being cancelled for next week. The meeting that had been scheduled previously will now no longer occur, and David may have been going to touch on that in his agenda item later, and whether or not we need to formally change that David or just with a notice of that meeting no longer occurring is just a heads up for you to cover off in your um, in your report please. Uh, is there any uh, conflicts of interest not currently um, identified? There are none. Um, there's no public forum uh, this week. Uh, we move on to item one which is the minutes of the ordinary meeting held via Zoom on the 15th of April. If someone moved that we accept those as true and accurate, moved Councillor Lyle, seconded Councillor McInnes, uh, is there any discussion on that item or on those minutes or any matters arising that aren't currently covered? There have been none. Um, we'll put that. All those in favour, please raise your hand. And I have Alexander, Epiha, McInnes, Gallagher, Lemon, Reed, Lyle, Hassan and Bland. Thank you for that. Uh, declare it carried. The only item uh, is the hot on hold item that's in our current matters requiring attention and the next item is a report from me. I have just taken some notes to try and cover things off. There's nothing written in this report but I have written down some things that will be included in the minutes of this meeting. Uh, just things are changing quite rapidly and I thought it's better to be able to give you up-to-date information as we discuss it today rather than writing something on Friday that um, just becomes out of date um, and doesn't include the latest. So uh, the annual Plan consultation opens today after our discussions uh, last week. Uh, we're looking for feedback from the community on the projects uh, that they see as necessary over the next 12 months and on the level of rates increase they think is appropriate uh, between zero and three and a half percent. We continue to have the welfare and safety of our community at heart um, and at the centre of everything that we're doing and our service desk remains hard at work responding to inquiries and calls for assistance. Uh, we're proactively reaching out to our vulnerable groups and our library staff have contacted over 1,500 senior citizen library members um, offering access to online resources and even one-on-one -on -one tuition on how to help with digital access. Uh, we've, we've been supporting the Ministry of, uh, for Social Development and contacting members of the Selwyn community for them uh, also. Uh, our food banks, food banks have been uh, hard at work um, with volunteers delivering much needed provisions uh, to those who most need it. Uh, across the district, a dedicated network of community response teams uh, delivered valuable information leaflets to mailboxes and more than 2,000 of those have been um, sent out. Uh, calling to households 
uh, has been good. And once we return to level three, um, I think that we should think about how we contact them businesses to get a better feel for where they're at. Uh, and I think we should also be um, contacting them to think about how we might point them to the support that's available. Um, there, that, a lot of that has been um, started already and is ongoing from a number of other agencies. And just as an, as an example, I've spoken with the Canterbury Employer Chambers of Commerce uh, yesterday. Uh, they're now offering their services to all businesses, not just to, to their members. Uh, they've recently completed a survey of businesses and so on um, respondents were included in that survey. Uh, a couple of items to note from there, 66% of the sell-in respondents thought that COVID was going to have a significant negative impact on staff uh, within their business and 80% reporting a significant negative impact on our business cash flow. So I mean, they, those are things that we would expect, but it's just some, some hard data that's come back. And uh, as previously reported, 52% uh, of sell-in businesses have continued under level four as a central business. Um, and that includes uh, our farmers too. But it's important to note that the agricultural sector has been hard hit, even though it's classed as an essential service, even just with meat companies reducing their capacity, meaning that farms can't reduce stocking rates uh, pre-winter and already eating into winter feed. So we just have to hope that uh, we do get a warm winter, otherwise the effects of this are going to be um, yeah, further reaching than they, than they already are. Uh, we've now got our eyes uh, on the future and are working hard to establish uh, what the move to level three is going to look like. And at the same time, we're developing a plan with our community to restore someone's economic strength while maintaining the welfare support for suffering businesses uh, and households and pointing people to the places where they can uh, receive that support. Uh, advice we've received from the National Emergency Management Agency, it's the new NEMA, it used to be called Civil Defence Emergency Management or the Ministry of Civil Defence and Emergency Management, now it's just NEMA, uh, is that we must continue to think and plan for recovery even while we're in this response phase. Uh, the Mayors of Canterbury are collectively sharing their plans for recovery to ensure we have a coherent regional plan uh, that is implemented and built from each town, ward and district up rather than from the top down. Uh, each area is different and a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate. Uh, this week the, the Mural Forum will be discussing possible responses to changes in tourism and the visitor markets. Uh, the Canterbury view continues to be that we should focus on value rather than volume and support access around Canterbury rather than just in a couple of areas. We also need to ensure there's clear benefit to host communities of tourism uh, and so that we can so that tourism maintains its social license to operate uh, and manages the effects of any tourism on our environment. And um, we know that for us in Selwyn, even the effects on Castle Hill uh, and the increase in volume that's gone on there has certainly changed the tracks uh, and the environment that's there and even the experience that you have when you go there, when there are lots of other people um, there too. Like many other businesses, um, our tourism sector uh, is facing really uncertain times uh, and it's un important that we work together as a region, that we can pool our resources, that we can use current expertise and avoid doubling up, um, remove barriers to collaboration where we can uh, and that will be a focus for the mural forum discussions later this week and I'll report back to you uh, next week uh, or the week after, sorry, when we have our next meeting on how, on how that went. Uh, there's some key advice that we've received about uh, response and this comes from Nima uh, out of Wellington and it starts by thinking about what our how do we understand COVID-19 as unique for our region as opposed to some of the other disasters that we've experienced? So there's lots of um, history that we have had with disasters, unfortunately. Some of that is relevant to, NEMA, uh, to COVID and some of it isn't. Uh, and we need to think about what's unique and what else might need to be done in response to this. Uh, we need to understand and list the consequences for our community. Uh, we need to start thinking about how um, our core recovery team might look and identify those, including Iwi, who are able to fully support and understand the consequences here. Uh, we need to stay across and understand the evolving consequences. So we need to link to planning and intelligence. We need to know who the community, um, we need to link with our community leaders uh, and contribute, allow them to contribute to what response is going to look like and help them to understand what the longer term consequences of this is going to be. Um, we need to update and confirm our key sector group contacts, uh, groups like the Chain, Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned before, DHBs, uh, MSD, and we've got DOC and NZTA obviously doing um, a lot of work in our district too and whatever um, our recovery planning looks like needs to involve those sorts of agencies uh, and it also needs to involve as I said earlier the, the ground up the town by town uh, and ward based um, information that we that we know and have um, but making sure that's up to date because we're not currently quite sure exactly where um, where someone sits because we haven't been able to meet with everyone like we normally would have uh, under normal circumstances. We also need to review our recovery preparedness and um, just ensure that we 
don't, uh, while we uh, exit the response phase or while we wind uh, some of the response phase down, which is very much still in play now, but as it transitions over time uh, to recovery, that we think about the resourcing that's going to be required and, and El Lawn will join us um, soon and provide a little bit of um, an update of how the response is going right now. So that's um, some advice from NEMA and I've um, included that in the bottom of this paper, which I'll be circulating um, to councillors. Uh, I've also had this other information that I think is important about, so when we think about what we are doing in, in our recovery sense. Um, so government has obviously commenced uh, the macroeconomic program and that, trying to understand what the blow is to the nation and what the national response is gonna to need to be. Um, and obviously the huge effort to underwrite people's incomes uh, in the short term. Um, has been a key part of that as well as other business support. So some of the other advice has been um, political leaders need to engage and guide their communities to consider alternatives um, to their recovery and weigh those up. Personal and group autonomy is important for social cohesion and growth. Again, it's not one size fits all. We need to think that local authorities continue to deliver programs and work to enable and support the communities that we serve. We need to think about our executive leaders and David and his team working within our local authority, um, Sale and District, to resource um, and direct the work of civil defence alongside business as usual, as that gets up. Although usual, obviously, is not um, quite going to be the same as it was earlier, but business is necessary for our council. Uh, local authorities need to engage with health and science experts to ensure accurate infection control information is provided to our communities, uh, and currently working with um, CDHB to ensure that we have cell and specific data um, available to us to understand um, there are currently no clusters uh, in Selwyn, but we need to understand uh, case numbers and if there was to be a significant change um, where that was and how we might play our part in uh, supporting the CDHB. Uh, we also need to, it also encourages local authorities to engage um, with business and social organisations to elicit and understand their concerns and seek ways to enable and support them. So uh, with all that sort of guidance in mind, I've instigated five meetings, uh, one for each ward, uh, and one for the district and councillors have been involved this week in um, thinking about who the key people might be uh, leaders within uh, the wards to, to start those meetings. They're going to be held later this week and early next week to allow a selection of key people and organisations to share what they're seeing in Selwyn uh, at the moment from a wellbeing perspective. This will help inform the sort of shape uh, Selwyn is in and what sort of response might be required. Uh, the key areas of concern are social and economic, uh, but other considerations including environmental need can be seen as well. Uh, Salmon District Council's role in this is the recorder of the current state of our community uh, in the first instance and gatherer and planner for the future as well. Uh, we have a wide variety of connections and knowledge of who might be able to help and support um, others. We'll be joining the dots and pointing people in the right direction. Our council doesn't have the resource or mandate from our community to step into the breach for families or business. Uh, however, we can support them to find central government and other agency support. And the thinking of these meetings is, can help us um, shape up what our recovery planning needs to look like, ensuring that it's fit for purpose, um, will meet local needs, is efficient in the manner uh, that it can deliver uh, to meet those needs within our community. And this information will be used by us as an organisation in preparation of our long-term plan uh, as we think about what our own investment, infrastructure and community service needs uh, are going to be from the Selwyn District Council organisational perspective. Uh, the meetings aren't intended to solve immediate problems, and if you're aware of immediate response, then please contact our civil defence team on 0800 Cell 1. Uh, there's a couple of other things that have been going on. Uh, I've been invited to sit on the NEMA Local Government Reference Group, um, and we've got three scheduled meetings a week. The purpose of this group is to help guide initial thinking from NEMA uh, as it's crafted, and to ensure that the principles and the way that they uh, are thinking of operating fit with local government and that local government concerns are factored into to that thinking before it gets shoved on us. Um, I continue to meet with our community board weekly uh, and the focus of tomorrow is going to be a presentation from staff on the annual plan um, and allow the community board to think about what their submission might look like. Uh, next week I'll be hosting a meeting of our council community committee chairs and secretaries to present in the same way uh, the annual plan to them and allow each of those community groups to be able to um, provide us with their feedback. Uh, and lastly, Anzac Day is on Saturday, uh, and it's going to be experienced under level four, which is quite a different Anzac experience to, to what we've um, had. Uh, I've been a part of pulling together Selwyn, a Selwyn ceremony following the public forum we had last week from Michelle Jones. Uh, and once this is shared, I welcome uh, you and anyone that's watching and anyone in Selwyn to um, be a part of the Selwyn Anzac commemorations. There's also obviously the national service being broadcast at 6 a.m. Um, or recorded and watched later if you want to um, watch it later in the day too. 
Uh, there's no gatherings um, at memorials and there's not to be any gatherings at memorials, uh, but the council has uh, made wreaths and we intend to lay them uh, in a safe and isolated manner just to respect those who have gone into battle and in our community's behalf uh, in days gone by and those who continue to serve our country uh, today and our armed forces. So I'm going to invite um, Al Lorne uh, to join us, but before I do that, I thought there may be some questions on some of the things that I've, I've raised, and if there are, you're more than welcome to ask any questions now. There being none, um, Al Lorne, I'll hand over to you. Thank you for joining us in this meeting, and if you can just give, a, give us an update from uh, the civil defence perspective and the work that's going on. Cheers. Thanks, Sam. Just a thumbs up if you can hear me. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just um, we continue to care for our communities by uh, essentially using those groups that are already within our communities, such as the three food banks we have, community response teams, of which there are 33. And there's about 180 people within our communities that are part of those community response teams. Uh, the health sector, the care groups, and uh, Lincoln University and the students that are still within that community uh, that are still here. So uh, we continue to help those, uh, continue to get their feedback. Um, there is not a huge demand, which uh, we're grateful for. Um, and we're planning for contingencies such as other events, which you would expect us to do. That's our job. If something else happens, uh, we know that we can continue to provide you at Selwyn with a really good service in regards to civil defence. We uh, continue to uh, respond and um, look at uh, what it looks like as the alert levels step down. So how does civil defence in Selwyn continue and, and respond through those levels? We're uh, making sure that we work hand in glove with uh, Denise Kids team, the community services team, who already have established links within our communities. And they are the people who will walk forward in, in recovery. Uh, we will step out and they will continue through those links which they've already got in community. Uh, but one thing which um, I always say is uh, we have one eye on the rear vision mirror. Uh, looking to see if this thing may rear its ugly head behind us. And so uh, we plan for the worst and hope for the best. Uh, good old Jack Reacher quote. And um, one thing I'll finish with is uh, I am totally in awe of our community's response, both at, at an individual level and as a community level. Um, they just blow me away by the way that they respond to people within their communities and look after them. And I, I know that that is why we don't have a huge influx of people uh, flooding us wanting help. It is because our communities are helping each other. And that is a huge, huge thing for us. And I'm immensely proud of our community. And I just want to say uh, our staff, uh, 17 of our staff have made over 1,700 calls in the last few weeks to those who are over 70 uh, and living with our internet and living alone. Um, most of those are really happy with where they are. The family are looking after them, etc. But uh, big shout out to those staff, those 17 staff. So if there's no questions, um, I'm happy to leave it there, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, we've got Sophie McInnes has a question. Hi, Al. Um, thanks as usual for your report and um, thanks to all your staff and your volunteers. I was just going to ask about the guys who are still camping over at Coase Ford. Um, is there any way, like, uh, are many of them expected to leave or are they actually now down to sort of Kiwi full-timer campers? So we have uh, some Kiwi full-time campers and we have a number of freedom campers who are either on work visas or they are on tourist visas and want work visas and want to stay in New Zealand. So we're working on a plan of uh, when things loosen up a bit, when can they travel? Uh, we don't intend them to be there over winter. So it's it's looking after them, but uh, we're not their mothers. Uh, but the thing in the back of my mind, if that was my, my child on the other side of the world, what would I expect that community to do to look after them and also help them to look after themselves? So it's that balancing act. That's a really good way of looking at it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Al, and thanks for that report. Um, and as Sophia said, if you could please pass on to 
um, your staff our thanks um, for the hours that they're putting in, but also the contact particularly that are made um, from people that are just loving our community uh, and wanting to, to serve and that the, the hearts of gold that your team have um, for Selwyn is really appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. I'll move that you, um, oh, Murray, you're happy to move that we receive the report. Yep, as seconder, Gallagher. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Alexander, Epeha, McInnes, Gallagher, Lemon, Reed, Lyle, Hassan, and Bland, declare it carried. Um, and now we move on to the Chief Executive's report. And so I have a mover and a seconder for that. It's moved Lyle, seconded Alexander. Thanks, David. Uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors, good afternoon. I will keep this very brief given uh, the depth of the report that came both from you, Mr. Mayor, and also from Al. Um, we're very active in three fronts that have been referred to. Uh, the management team, firstly, the EOC that Al is running, and also the recovery response teams. We're keeping our two recovery spot response teams in place, albeit next week that uh, group of uh, those two groups will morph back into the executive leadership team. Focus for the response recovery team this week is really preparing for level three, which kicks in on Tuesday of next week. Um, key things we're doing are liaising directly with contractors. They were expecting to be back on the job for a range of jobs next week across the district. Reviewing our health and safety practices, observing uh, the comments that the Prime Minister continues to uh, put forward in terms of the protection of our staff as our first priority. Uh, looking at those activities that we will be undertake, albeit in part when we get back into level three, and also looking at how we're going to be able to prepare our facilities for reopening when we get to level two. Next week, we'll be doing two things concurrently. The first one is more of those four things that I've just uh, referred to, to make sure we're moving in the right direction. And secondly, thinking about level two and what that's going to mean to our business, uh, the way we conduct, the way we interact, not only with each other, but with the community across the district as well. We do acknowledge that the position changes rapidly, um, but I'd have to say and uh, echo Al's comments that uh, the knowledge, the experience and the agility that we have shown across the district are, I think, second to none, and also the communication lines and the ability to get information out to the community. And of course, we recognise our role in reigniting the local economy and the welfare issues. Um, during this week, we had our interdepartmental meeting and just a couple of little snippets that I'll share with you. Um, we have a daily duty planner uh, a role where that person is available and comments back from the position generally are that the number of inquiries that we are continuing to receive are about normal. So I'm comfortable with that. In terms of building consents, um, the month of March of 2020, we actually set a record, 289 building consents came through the organisation, so that's an all-time record. As of Friday of last week, for the month of April, we had 129 uh, new building, uh, as you were, building consent applications received. We are promoting the availability and access to event applications online. Uh, you've made reference to the library calls. Library staff say that not only are they getting a lot of pleasure out of those, but so are the people on the end of the phone and are saying that on average, those phone calls take somewhere between 10 minutes and 40 minutes. So they're not just very quick, hi, hello, how are you? They, they are very deep um, phone calls. And finally, our staff involved in exercise programs tell us that they have had over a thousand hits on our exercise programs that we have available for the community. So again, getting good response to the um, activities that we're putting forward. Uh, just to finish, Mr. Mayor, as you said, draft annual plan consultation starts today. We have a number of meetings scheduled across uh, the district, including with the community committees next week, but just an open invitation for anybody looking for a, a specific presentation, please make sure you contact uh, council through myself in the first instance, and we will arrange for that to happen. Obviously, we're uncertain of the 
way we're going to be able to, to, to fully conduct consultation during the lockdown period, but hopefully that lockdown period will only operate in part of our consultation process. Mr. Mayor, happy to answer any questions. Sorry, you talked about formal cancellation for next week. Staff will go through and formally cancel next week's meeting. I just note from the diary that our next formal council meeting is scheduled for the 13th of May. That will be hopefully when we're back in level two and hopefully that will be back in our chambers. If there is the need to hold a council meeting between now and then, we, we do have appropriate time available on the 6th of May as well. Happy to answer questions, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, David. And just for, for clarity, can you just comment on um, level three, moving to level three doesn't change um, access to any of our facilities for the public. Everything is still closed. Um, and the guidance is mm -hmm. that everyone works from home um, as long as they uh, can continue uh, to do that. Uh, the libraries obviously will still provide the same online sort of um, as they have been uh, up till now, but uh, there's no, the libraries aren't opening, the pool isn't opening, um, but is the resource recovery park opening? Can you just sort of run through any of those? Yeah, um, everything you've said is correct. So firstly, none of our facilities, buildings, halls, reserves are open to the public. So we're still very much in lockdown. The two things that we are hopeful of changing, firstly, the resource uh, recovery park, and we're working through with our contractors, just putting health and safety our regime in place for that. And secondly, limited building inspections. We're also hopeful of getting underway, Mr. Mayor, next week as well. Uh, you can uh, you can go and visit our parks, uh, but you can't play on playground equipment. Thank you for that, David. Uh, any questions? I can't see any in the... Uh, Councillor Alexander. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you asked one of my questions, which was about the re reopening of the Pines, which was all recovery park. David, um, your, con your comments about contractors, does that mean that the parks and reserve maintenance is likely to resume? That's been a commonly asked question in the community. Yeah, that's one of those things we're focusing on, Councillor Alexander, going back to the contractors, of which there are several, just making sure that the correct health and safety regimes are in place. That's one of the priority areas that we're working through this week and we'll be able to advise uh, not only elected members, but more importantly, the public as soon as possible when we have that outcome. And the other question or request that I have from the community is will we continue to live stream our meetings once we move back to the chamber? There's actually a fair number of people, more than we normally get in public in our public gallery, watching our meetings and they'd quite like to be able to continue watching from home. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? There's a number of learnings that we've heard through this lockdown period and very clearly the way we do our business and the way we conduct our meetings is one of those. And uh, again, Councillor Alexander, that is one of those things that we are engaging with staff just to uh, understand how we, would, uh, how we would go about that, where we would place cameras, et cetera. I don't see any further blue hands. Um, someone we've moved and seconded by Lyle and Alexander. All those in favour that we receive the CEO's report, please raise your hand. I have Alexander, Epaha, McInnes, Gallagher, Lemon, Reed, Lyle, Hassan, Bland and Miller, declare it carried. Um, we move into item three now, which is the District Licensing Committee Inspectors Monthly Report. And uh, welcome along, Malcolm Johnson. Malcolm, if you want to turn your, uh, thank you, your video on and um, talk us through the highlights of the report and noting Councillor Hassan's um, conflict as um, requested. Thank you. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, Mr. Neil, all right? Excellent. My, um, my reports is tabled. I just want to add that we've still seen a consistent number of applications still coming through, which is good. Um, and I was really pleased to see MBIE change their criteria back at the start of April to allow all our off licenses now to trade, albeit remotely. So all our off licenses now are able to trade. Uh, the last thing I'd say is level three, um, unfortunately, probably won't mean any change realistically for our licensed premises. Though it'll still be remote. We will still not see cafes or bars uh, opening to the public. So other than that, Mr. Mayor, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Uh, councillors, any questions for Malcolm uh, McInnes? 
Hi, Malcolm. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to say it was great to see that um, you've got the section there about um, special license dates able to be changed, um, particularly for the community groups um, who are going to presumably use them as a fundraiser. Is that something that you guys decided or is it nationwide? Yeah, that's something that, that the law allows. We can change the dates for what up to 12 months and even longer for some single events. So now that's something that's allowable by law. Cool. Well, it's really nice because they're going to obviously need to do a lot more fundraising to catch up as well. So that's great to see. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sophie. Are you happy to move that report? And a seconder. Uh, Reid. All those in favour, please raise your hand. Alexander, Epiha, McInnes, Gallagher, Lemon, Reed, Lyle, Bland, and Miller. We could have carried. Thank you, Malcolm, Kakiti. for that. Kakiti. Uh, uh, the next item is item number four, pages 26 through 38, and it's support for ratepayers in response to COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, Greg or David, I'll um, hand over to you. Thank you. So I'll, I'll pick up. Uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a follow on to our report um, to the 8th of April meeting, and it's about how we can help support ratepayers who may be facing some financial difficulties, but whilst also looking after the interests of all ratepayers. So it's in, it's in four parts. It's about penalties, it's about extended payments out to June 21, and about extension of payments out to June 22, and also about a rates postponement policy. So I'll go through each in turn, but maybe I'll share my screen if that's okay and just refer to the relevant bits. Just, um, yes, that would be good, thanks, Greg. Yeah, so that, that's the uh, resolution there in four parts. I'll just go down to the four sections. So the first one is about um, uh, late payment penalties. So we set uh, the penalty regime before the start of the rating year. So typically in June each year, we set the penalties for the coming year from the 1st of July to the 30th of June. So penalties for the current year are set, and we'll set the penalties for 2021 in, uh, in June this year. So we can't set the penalties now, but we can indicate maybe our intent to rate payers. So under the Rating Act, you can set penalties of up to 10%, and that's what most councils do in actual fact. But it's fair to say that at the current time, 10% seems a fairly a high amount, fairly harsh, and I think it would be a reasonable and good thing to do to reduce penalties down so that um, it's still an incentive for those that can afford to pay to pay, but for those that are struggling, it's, it's less penal on them, so less, less of a penalty for them. It does commit a cost though. Uh, I estimate that it might be about $450,000 less penalty revenue next year. So it's, it's not a decision to be made without understanding the cost of it. I think it is a, a fair response to the current situation. As I say, the recommendation is simply a signaling of intent, not an actual decision. The next of the four is around extending payments out to, um, to June 2021. I've got a little table here, which I'll just talk you through in a second. Uh, so between now and June 2021, it's 14 months or so. So the idea is here that, that ratepayers could go on a a lower payment for a period uh, for half of that time for seven months and then after seven months go on to a, a higher payment. So the, the table there uh, tries to illustrate how this would work. So I mean, this is just numbers to try and make it easy to understand. A uh, $4,000 rates bill, so $1,000 per instalment. So there's one instalment still to come in this rating year, that's the one due 15th of June and four instalments next year. So $5,000 to pay over the period to June 2021. So this illustration is somebody paying a, a minimum amount of $10 a week for 30 weeks. So paying $300 over that 30 weeks and then paying 30 weeks at $156.67. That's paying 4,700 over that period. And that's about double what you'd pay if you were paying the same amount for the whole period, uh, a typical direct debit payment. So the, the idea is that to, to our people who've maybe facing a struggle for a little while to put things off and then catch up, catch up later. And the idea would be that this would be available to all rate payers that are facing difficulties. They wouldn't have to prove that, but they would have to go on a, on a direct debit 
And so direct debit allows us to control the payment system. The third of um, the initiatives is extended payments out to 2022, so June 2022. So it's similar to the one I've just gone through, but, but a longer period. And there's two sort of sub options. The first of the sub options is um, paying those $10 payments out to November this year for 30 weeks. And then for a period of what will be 82 weeks, paying a higher amount of $106.10. So $106.10 would then recover the 8,700 still to be paid over that um, period of uh, what's effectively 26 months. Um, and the alternative to that is to have those lower payments running for a longer period, say out to June 2021. And so that would be a period of 61 weeks of paying $10, so paying 610 over that period. And then in the 12 months from July 21 to June 22, paying $161 a week, so paying 8,390 over that period. So then again, you're paying $161 for that year compared with a standard flat rate of what would be $76.92. These numbers have been done for illustration purposes and don't take into account any rate increases for the next uh, two rates years. So I think I must point out that the extending payments out to June 22 does give us some cause for concern from a staff point of view in terms of rate payers building up arrears over a period of time, which they may struggle to, to catch up. We do find that once rate payers get behind with payments, it is the catch up which can be really, really painful. But it does, does give quite a lot of flexibility. Um, to have this extension out to 2022, we would expect ratepayers to prove that they've suffered during the current um, environment. Uh, so actually show that they've lost a job or have reduced income or something like that. The fourth part is um, what's called a rates postponement policy. So a rates postponement policy is set under the Local Government Act and also the, the Rating Act. And the, the concept is that for a period of time, your, your rates are postponed, and it's usually postponed until the point at which your property is sold. And during that period, the rates still accrue with interest, and then that large bill potentially is then settled at the time the, the property is, is sold. And quite a few councils have this policy in place. It's typically available for those over 65, and those that hold quite a substantial amount of equity in their property, but have a low income. Although there isn't generally a high take up of this, of this policy across the country. Um, the key thing is that, that there needs to be clear criteria and conditions for postponement, uh, in particular, a high level of equity in the, in the house, because that's the security for the, uh, for the debt and that the house is kept insured, etc. There also needs to be a consultation process under the Local Government Act requirements, so that takes a bit of time as to setting up all the supporting admin procedures. Also, I think it's important that anyone who takes out a rates postponement does take independent advice on the matter because it is quite a big financial decision. So I don't see this as really a uh, particular thing to help the current situation where we might have rate payers with relatively low equity facing short term income difficulties. It's more for those who have large amount of equity later on in life. I do think it, though, it could be a useful policy and maybe we should develop it as part of the uh, long term plan process. So those are the four elements to the package um, that the council has asked for. Happy to take questions. Councillor McInnes and then Councillor Alexander. Sorry, I didn't realise I had my hand up still. <laughs> ah, <laughs> that's okay. Councillor Alexander. Thank you. I have Two questions for Mr. Bell, the first of which is with respect to part one. The potential loss of income, your estimate is four hundred from fifty to $500,000. Does that actually add a further challenge to the chief executive as he looks for savings to reduce the rate increase? And we're actually talking there is about a decrease of income. So that actually adds to a potential deficit rather than helping it. Yes, it does. Um, that, that is income that would normally go to the general rate account. Okay, thank you. The second question is to part three, the business uh, rates payment period. Um, would we, what will happen 
when the rate paying business is not the property owner? Are we going to include the property owner in include them in or in, advise them of these negotiations? Because potentially I could foresee a scenario where a business is able to defer some of their rates payment and then they go bust. And of course, if they're not the property owner, they're not the person left carrying the can. And I can imagine a property owner being a bit unhappy if they actually find that their tenant has deferred some of their rates, gone bust, and not only are they missing their rate, their rent, potentially they're left in the can for a deferred rates payment. So are we going to include, make sure that the landlord is involved in these negotiations? Yeah, thank, thank you. That The question, I think it illustrates the complexity of, of what we might be getting into a little bit here. Uh, in the main, most ratepayers are the owner. Um, uh, lessees only um, have responsibility for rates under certain leases, um, and there probably aren't that many of them, but it is a, a genuine uh, uh, question that, uh, that, that might arise. So we would, I think, seek to contact the owner as well as the ratepayer in this case, but it would act, add an extra layer of complexity here. So good question. Thank you. Um, do we have a mover and a seconder for the report? Move from Miller, seconded Alexander. Is there any further questions? Councillor Miller? You're on mute, Grant. My apologies for that. Um, I, like Councillor Alexander, are uh, concerned about cost transference, I guess. Whilst I'm really in support of trying to assist our ratepayers who are experiencing difficulties and have trouble paying their rates, um, as Councillor Alexander suggests, we are straight away making the chief executive's hard job harder <laughs> by asking him to find more savings to keep to a zero rate increase or close to it. So um, we need to remember that um, and be absolutely transparent to all our ratepayers that any assistance we give to one group of ratepayers is ultimately paid by the wider group. And um, I think everyone's aware of that. And if we're all on board with that, that's fine. But um, option three that Greg describes to me um, seems a very difficult uh, option to apply and maintain with any equity. And I would suggest that in my view, it may be better to drop that option three off and review it at the end of have options one and two. And if option two still has significant demand at the end of that period, we could look at extending option two and giving a further opportunity to defer payments. But um, as um, Mr. Bell suggests, I, I am concerned about a group, a group of ratepayers who get significant level of rating debt um, racked up and then find um, it all becomes extremely, extremely difficult to get back to square one and having been involved in the past with assisting with rate collection, um, as Mr. Bell knows, it can become extremely difficult and um, extremely frustrating both for the council and for the ratepayer trying to get back to a, to a position where you are square with the ledger. Um, so that'd be my my desire is perhaps see options one and two um, today with option with the extent, option to extend option two when it expires. Um, I particularly want to support um, the rates postponement policy. I think it's got a real place in our, um, our organisation not only uh, for over 65s, but um, a, a large portion of our community at, st at stages within their lives and careers uh, would like to postpone their rates. I think there's the opportunity to then get back on track by repaying rates. And if it's structured correctly, there should be no additional cost to other ratepayers by running a well-run rates postponement policy. Um, so I, I certainly want to see this on our agenda to, to be implemented or brought to our, our wider ratepayer attention that they can have consultation on it. So I think um, it has real merit and does give our ratepayers the opportunity, particularly our older um, ratepayers who have had, um, who perhaps asset rich and cash poor, and when they go into superannuation, find that rating burden takes a significant portion of their superannuation. For them to have the opportunity to stay in their home and stay in Selwyn without that large rates burden, I think could be a real boon for them. So um, that's where I'm coming from. I, Sam, are you wanting for us to put that up as an amendment or debate that issue or whether we should drop option three or is there other is there more widespread support? Am I alone in thinking that that's, that's an option? Uh, so I had assumed that your hand up was um, moving the, um, as it is in our papers, one, three, three. So if that wasn't what your intention was, um, we'll just withdraw that. Um, but at the moment, I was expecting that you and Alexander had just moved one, or A, one, two, three, and B. 
Um, is yeah, sorry, I had my, my um, video on mute and wasn't probably as clear. And it's my fault. I apologise for that. That's okay. Um, so, so you you're removing that grant, and you uh, you weren't intending to move all of that. No, I mean, I, my preference is options one and two, with option two having the option to extend. But um, I want, I'd like something like the wider group to to give their feedback as to whether they want the full package board in today. I, I I have concerns about the the ability for us to implement option three and its manageability. Um, as I said, I'm really supportive of being able to support our ratepayers, um, but we also need to understand how is this going to be applied, and are we creating a problem for our ratepayers when options one and two provide solutions? And if it needs further extension, we could look at extending option two at its expiry. Um, it's an option, but I, I'd certainly like to see whether that well, I'm alone in this thought or whether there's other people that support this this way of thinking. Okay. Uh, are there any other thoughts around the council table? Uh, Councillor Lemon. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Uh, look, I'm supportive of uh, what um, Councillor Miller is proposing. I think looking at option three, um, hopefully at that stage we'll be uh, into LTP and we'll be able to have the discussion around um, rates postponement policy and it may be that option three is not required. So I guess that gives us the op uh, opportunity at, at LTP discussion to reinstate three if we found that was the best option. We don't have to leap on that necessarily straight away. So. Uh, very much in support of that. So if Councillor Miller's moving in that direction as an amendment, I'm happy to second. Thanks. I won't need an amendment at the moment because we don't have a, a motion uh, on the table. We'll just have allow this discussion and then we'll, we'll move and then seek some advice from Greg before we um, formally move and second and vote on anything. Uh, Councillor Alexander? Yes, thank you. I'm in support of what Councillor Miller said. In fact, I'm quite happy to move A1 and 2 and B um, to support that because I think that there are the problems in three are, are a lot. And if an ordinary business rate payer is able to take option two to get them through to the end of the, the next financial year, and then we look then as part of our long-term plan, we review whether we continue that, I think that's a better option. And as Mr. Bell has said, the complexity in three is just growing as we look at it. So I'm happy to move A, one, two, and B. Thank you. Um, and I'm wondering, Mark, uh, or my, my concerns are the same as what has already been raised around not allowing people to get too far into debt that actually they can't get themselves out and we're not helping them um, in doing that. I just wonder whether though three um, could be just shortened and would say we consider an extended payment period the 30th of June 2022 as part of the long-term plan and that just signals that we are we would consider it um, and that it's there and it says to the community um, that we haven't drawn a line under it, but uh, that, that door is still open, but we're not willing to put it in place at the moment because we're not sure that it's in the best interest either of us as a council or for them as an individual ratepayer. Uh, Councillor Lyle? Yes, I support that course of action. Um, you've sort of beaten me to it. I think, and I understand the reservations that have been brought by Councillor Miller and Councillor Alexander, and they're very fair. Um, but I, I do think we, we need to keep this in mind so it can be used. The impact in our community uh, is only become, going to become apparent in the next six to 10 months. So I would support us uh, putting in black and white that we are willing to look at it at a later date. Okay, Councillor Alexander is happy um, that that be the motion and Councillor Miller second. Great, any further discussion on that? Uh, Councillor Epaha and then Councillor McInnes. Sorry, Sam, I put my hand up because I wanted to support it. Thank oh, you. Great. C Councillor McInnes. Kia ora. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to support that as well. And I just, this is beyond our remit, but I was wondering whether uh, Mr. Bell was aware of whether, or anybody of whether central government is looking at doing anything to extend the rates relief scheme that they run. Um, we can't obviously do anything about that, but that might also be another form of relief for some ratepayers who are looking at reducing bills at a time of you know, poor income. Uh, Greg, you may be able to comment uh, from a staff perspective on that. It's certainly been something that our National Council has raised uh, and we have a meeting next week, Local Government New Zealand National Council, and uh, I'll be bringing that as a matter that needs advocacy uh, to central government. Thank you, Sophie. Greg, I wonder whether you could comment on that. Uh, and also I had a question around the penalties that are applied. Are they part of our budget? 
or are they part of the the surplus that comes in on top of the budget? Are we budgeting on on those penalties? Um, just to know whether moving forward, is it actually money David has to find, or is it money that comes in every year on top of what we were expecting? Yes. Um, so, so first up, in terms of the rate, rebate scheme, I'm not aware of any specific proposal to extend it, but clearly it would be a good way of, of supporting ratepayers. The slight challenge with it is it, it works a year behind in terms of looking back a year at previous year's income. So that's possibly the difficulty there. Uh, and yes, we do budget for rates penalties. So this would be an adjustment in effect to our budget. And if I could just make a third comment in terms yep. of uh, possibly um, not implementing uh, a three yet, but considering it later, a decent option would, would of course be to see how things are going. And then in, um, I don't know, August, September, uh, see how many people have adopted the, um, the option of an extension and potentially open it up if we feel um, it relevant to those people to extend further. So you're saying uh, before the long-term plan might be a better time than as part of the long-term plan? Well, I'm thinking if we were putting people onto uh, an extension where they had to start paying more in December, um, we're, we're kind of assuming that their finances are in shape by December this year, but we're not quite sure that's going to be the case. So it, it may be that at that point, we're better able to judge whether people uh, could really do with a bit more of an extension. Okay, so with the mover and second uh, being okay with that three, be consider an extended payment period to 30th of June 2020 prior to um, November 2020. Sorry, extended period through to 2022, considering it prior to November this year, in line with what Greg has just um, said. Grant, is you okay with that? Yeah, I'm extremely happy to, to, to support that. I mean, I think what we're all saying around the table is that we are open and flexible to, to helping our ratepayers, um, but also trying to manage what we have in front of us. and. Um, and, and making it as user friendly as possible. So, you know, I've got no problem with supporting that. Great, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Um, A123 is consider an extended payment period through the 30th of June 2022 in November 2020, uh, or prior to uh, November 2020. Uh, and B, support the preparation of the rates postponement policy as part of the long term plan. All those in favour, please raise your hands. And we have Epiha, McInnes, Gallagher, Reed, Miller, Bland, Alexander, Lyle, Lemon, Hassan, and declare it carried. Thanks, Greg, uh, for your work on that. And uh, and thank your staff as well, please. The next item is on uh, pages 39 through 50, and it's the uh, Prebleton Park Master Plan. Uh, there's two recommendations. Firstly, that we receive the report outlined in the proposed master plan and that we approve the master plan is suitable to be forwarded for notice of requirement processes. Moved Councillor Lyle. Seconded Councillor Miller, and I'll invite um, our staff, Douglas and Phil Miller, to um, talk us through the report. Thank you, Worship. I'll, I'll get Phil Miller just to introduce it. He and uh, his colleagues have done a lot of work with the community, uh, and after that, we can take any questions that you may have. So I'll pass over to you, Phil. Thanks, Douglas. Uh, can everyone hear me? Good. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Sam and Councillors. Um, uh, my report is be, to be taken as read, but I would like to bring your attention to a few points. Um, this is a significant uh, new park for the Springs Ward. And um, to put it into context, uh, Foster Park is 30 hectares, uh, Prebleton Domain is 13 hectares, and this new park that we're planning for Prebleton on Birches Road is 22 hectares. So it sits in between the size of Foster Park and Prebleton Domain. Uh, $12 million uh, allocated in the uh, LTP budget over the next um, 10 years, um, with stage one uh, over the next three years, um, containing about 6 million of that. Uh, where we're at in the process is that we've taken the draft master plan to the public in November 2019. We had overwhelmingly positive feedback and many good ideas from the public have been incorporated. Uh, and you can actually uh, read of the uh, many of the good ideas in Appendix A, which is attached to this report. We have incorporated, incorporated many of the ideas from the public uh, into the, the uh, revised master plan. And uh, we've also incorporated um, some of the recommendations from the specialist reports. We've had four specialist reports done on the uh, park as well. 
The updated concept master plan is uh, enclosed as uh, Appendix B. I'd like to try and uh, share my screen uh, and show you the uh, master plan if you haven't got that in front of you. Uh, there's the uh, current master plan uh, seen from Appendix B. It incorporates uh, many of the uh, new ideas, but also you can see quite a lot of the plan is similar to what we uh, what we um, uh, shared uh, uh, with the public. Uh, we have made a few changes to the location of the maintenance zone, the entrance to the car park, and a few other details, but many other of the um, features are still in the same sort of locations as they were uh, previously. The new park will be differentiated from Prevalton Domain and other parks in the area, and that will provide a distinctly native and rustic rural style parkland experience for active recreation uh, users and uh, park users. So, just where we're at in the process now is that we are about to um, lodge the master plan to, uh, for you know, our application. So uh, we seek the council's approval to proceed with uh, lodging the uh, master plan for notice for requirement uh, approval. Uh, Thanks very any, much any for questions that. Questions from anyone? Thank you, Phil. Uh, firstly, Councillor Lyle, then Councillor Hassan, and then Alexander. It's not really a question. I would just like to congratulate your team on the sterling work that you've done. Um, the public have said to me they're very happy with the consultation process that's been undertaken. They are very much looking forward to um, the extra recreational area. Indeed, as in a time of lockdown, the, uh, the 4,000 people who have their bubbles wandering around Prebleton at the moment, uh, walking and cycling, um, could really do with this space right now. Um, and uh, with some of the uh, comments around dog behaviour in the community of recent times, uh, that the fenced dog exercise area uh, is well overdue and well uh, looked forward to. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for the way in which you've gone about it and the detailed uh, plan. It's very exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing its implementation. Good. Thank you. Uh, next we have Councillor Hassan. Thank you, Sam. Um, look, I appreciate all the work that's gone on, but for those that are listening, um, they look at the budget of perhaps of 12 million in this time of crisis and are thinking, how can the council think of actually spending this amount of money on a park? So what I'd like um, maybe Greg or um, one of the team to explain is the percentage of this funding that has comes from development contributions um, and the percentage of funding that is actually funded through the, the through the ratepayers contribution um, just with regards to, so our public can understand that they are not fitting all the bill. Thank you. Uh, Greg are you on board or Douglas are you able to answer that? I'm not sure whether Greg can probably give an exact number but the, the most of the uh, development cost here is development contribution funded because it's predominantly meeting growth needs for that community. So it is, it is cash that in some cases we hold or some cases will go forward. One of the things we've already discussed though is if you're trying to find budget savings, getting operating costs uh, and you know, removing those is always the question. So. There may be certain things that we look at in terms of it, ultimately how we develop the park. Some of the costs might be ones that we could defer for argument's sake. The playing fields, mowing those has a cost if you didn't need those playing fields due to the perhaps some drop in need for the playing fields due to um, sports, then you may not develop those straight away. Certainly the framework though in terms of the trees and those walking tracks, uh, that would be good things to do. But yes, mindful of opportunities, and that is something we can certainly look at. I don't know if Greg can add any further to the development cost share. Greg, if you're still there, uh, you're able to add some clarity. Deborah, it's an answer that we can get um, in detail and we'll provide back to uh, councillors and report it at the meeting next week. Uh, Councillor Alexander and then Reid and Malcolm. 
Thank you. And yes, my congratulations to the team for the design and the consultation. The question I asked prior to the meeting so that the team had a chance to consider the answer was, it wasn't clear in this master plan diagram what vehicle access there was to the sporting areas, because it is important that emergency vehicles can access these sports field areas. I have seen unfortunate accidents at our sports fields and the need to get emergency vehicles onto the grounds to minimize the transfer distance of injured players. So that was um, the question I asked and they may want to share their answer. Yeah, that was a good question, Mark. Um, we have um, provided for access from Leadley's Road to the sports fields and there will be um, uh, also uh, emergency access to the car park. So we will have a, a secondary access onto the car park uh, in the event of emergency as well, should there be a um, uh, accident at the uh, entrance to the car park. But yes, that's a requirement we actually um, have to, uh, sorry, our uh, planner who is doing the um, notice requirement for us, uh, advise that we should uh, provide uh, emergency access onto the uh, playing fields as well. So we have covered that off. Councillor Reid. I also want to give a, a big thanks to the staff, um, Phil and Dylan, for the work that particularly that they've been doing on this plan. And speaking from my perspective, I'm being councillor involved with the Little River Rail Trail Trust. It's good to see that the uh, trail has been incorporated in it. And it's also been good to hear and being involved with discussions with staff about how we incorporate some of that history and um, be sympathetic to that in, in the park as well. That's still something that they're looking at and it's more other history for the area, the local um, iwi, et cetera as well. So I think that's to be commended as well. So we actually have our local history recorded where we where we can and where it's easily accessible for other people to be able to see in the area. Thank you. Councillor Lyle, I'll come to you at the end as um, right of reply um, through this process. Is there anyone else that wants to say anything? Uh, the only thing I'd add is um, yeah, out my thanks to staff for doing this. It seems like each new park that council develops uh, ends up being the envy of um, every other park dweller. And as Foster Park's gone up, everyone's like, why can't I have a Foster Park in, in my town? And now seeing this one, people are like, why can't we have one of these in my town? Um, and so it's really good to see that that level um, of development is continuing. And we think about how we do things better than we've done them um, before each time we're developing something new, learning from our mistakes and also implementing best practice today. Um, really pleased to see the amount of native planting that's going in there. Uh, and the point of difference around rounded edges rather than square edges, I think, is um, yeah, is quite a different change than um, most of our other parks. So thank you, Douglas, Phil, and the rest of your team. Please, please pass our thanks uh, on to them. Um, Councillor Lyle, I'll come back to you, and then I'll put the motion. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'd echo those comments, Sam. It's great to see us increasing our biodiversity uh, in, a, in a recreational space like this. And I'd just like to point out that this is a reserve for the whole of Selwyn. Um, there's a dog park there, which I'm sure will be used by people throughout the community as the existing facilities we have are well and truly oversubscribed as it is. I too am delighted to see the rail trail going through there, having been involved um, back in 2006 uh, with the original trail. Uh, it's great to see it there. And I'll just remind those who are concerned about the funding that um, with the extreme amount of development that's happened, in and around Prebleton to give us a population base of around 4,000 people. Up until 2017, there was $14 million collected from development contributions just from Prebleton developments alone. So um, th there's, a, there's a fair fighting fund that has gone into our reserves developments that have been donated, or <laughs> some might say not donated, uh, by our development uh, community uh, towards these sort of processes. And, once again, thanks very much for the process um, and, and I'm very much looking forward to the outcome. Thank you. So that we receive and approve the report. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hand. And I have Epiha, McInnes, Gallagher, Reed, Lemon, Miller, Alexander, Lyle, Hassan and Bland to clear it carried. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas and Phil, for that report. And Douglas, you'll be staying on 
uh, with us for the property transaction update that's next on our agenda. Uh, pages 51 through 61, um, the update is in your reports, and Douglas, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'll just take 30 seconds to talk about mowing, uh, which was asked by Councillor Alexander. So, yes, we are looking to get back on to mowing our various reserves. Uh, there is a wee bit of a challenge, which is a positive challenge, but a lot of people are using our reserves, as we well know. So we've got to make sure we've got adequate health and safety and separation from mowing activities and the public. So uh, we will certainly, we've got a wee bit of a, um, well, a, it's a good challenge to make sure we overcome, but we may not mow every piece of grass because some don't need to be doing, but we're certainly focusing on our recreation reserves and certainly um, our parks, which get a grade one or a catch um, and grade two, which is a non-catch, but just, just trying to get our grass banks down. This time of year, they're having a bit longer grass it's not always the end of the world. So moving now to the report, uh, I'll just add a wee bit about the COVID lockdown process. So the, the general sort of view coming from the various uh, contractors, particularly the major builds and consultants sort of a, with a bit of a, a view is that you, you could be with COVID looking at a two to five month uh, deferral on opening times of some of your buildings. Uh, re the main reasons for that is obviously we've had we'll have five weeks in the lockdown period. Uh, once contractors come back, they have to obviously gear up again. They've got to train their staff, particularly in any new protocols around, around COVID, it's really important. So commissioning will take um, potentially you know, a week or so to get going. And then the big unknown question is supply chains. Um, the final comment would be is that we're a wee bit fortunate in that our four major builds are really all at foundation level so workers work having to work in close proximity if they were doing fit outs and that type of activity where sometimes you do have to work close to move items around we don't have that particular challenge with our large build so that is, that is helpful but it really comes down to the supply change uh, issues i think we've had we've had a few questions regarding uh projects as we've um from councillors council alexander raised a number of us which were very helpful the main comment will be the next report, which comes to you in May, will have a bit more certainty about timing. And the final comment I'd make is that we're obviously, like the infrastructure team, we're working with our contractors on endeavouring to get them back up and running from Tuesday uh, next week. What we do need, though, is updated health and safety plans, particularly around the COVID issues, and they are well documented uh, sector by sector, so it's not too hard to get that information. But we do need to see it, we need to know intent. Uh, some plans will be more extensive than others, obviously with size of site and that type of thing. I think a key point we want to make sure is that we do have appropriate protocols from our contractors. The last thing we need is having something not done so well and then having slippage, which doesn't help anyone. So have to take any questions that you have on this report. Thank you. I can see uh, Councillor Reid does, but I just wonder whether we'll go through um, just item by item and as, if, as questions come up, take them that way. Um, Nicole, is there something about the whole report or on a particular matter? Ah, oh, <laughs> previous question. Uh, so first of all, we've got the Selwyn Aquatic Centre extension and the Rolleston Library and Community Centre to Araatia, Foster Park Indoor Courts, Foster Park Dines Road Car Park, Club Rooms Relocation, Brookside Road, Anzac Lane subdivision. Responsible Camping Working Group and Tourism Infrastructure Fund projects. Surplus Crown Land Disposal Project. Mead Hall Seismic Assessment Report. Leaston Library Medical Centre Earthquake Seismic Weather Tightness Assessment. Yeah, the report back date presumably has shifted to the current circumstances. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Alexander. We're, we're obviously going out for consultation during the annual plan. Uh, we will be report back as part of the annual plan submission deliberation process on, on where we are. So we have started work on medical centre, what we call bulk and location, to get a feeling for that. Um, and we're, but we won't be undertaking anything further on community centre options at this time. 
Uh, and obviously the, the property we purchased, uh, we settled on that about a week ago. So that was very helpful with time there. Thank you. Uh, Hororata Community Centre. Yes, Grant and then McInnes. Thank you. Um, the, the report sort of describes um, funding issues, I guess, and the funding source has some uncertainty about it, I guess. It's one of those nasty nettles that you're better to grasp early and discuss with the community now about funding rather than raising expectation of a four and a half million dollar build if the funding's not there. So I guess I'd, I'm really supportive of, of actually us understanding where the funding levels are at and, and what our commitment to this project is. We've already lost potentially some of the funding streams with the old hall perhaps now being classified as historical. So is there any update that the staff can give us on that stream, please? So the uh, Go Harata uh, and the Horata Trust have both had meetings in the last three weeks. I was using Zoom. So certainly that was a main focus of my discussion with the reps last week, I think it was. It's just that, you know, you obviously got a bit of a bit of a bit of a hurdle to jump over. Uh, they they acknowledge that. Uh, they are sort of obviously um, you know positive as you'd like to think them to be. The, the key issue now is though, as we all know, to go to groups and get funding, you need some certainty about what a plan looks like. So that's what our, we're currently working with the trust uh, and go power out on us to get some certainty about what is the building look like so we can now start to put packages forward. But yeah, no, it's certainly a live issue. Thank you. And Councillor McInnes. Um, my question was very similar to um, Councillor Miller's. Just that's a, a really expensive looking building, um, which at the moment will be raising a lot of eyebrows for anybody reading this report. Um, I know it says that it's you know, not likely to happen for another two or three years, but um, it's, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for everyone to have their say on exactly how big and flash this building needs to be. Thanks, Sophie. Yep, and that's exactly right. Next, we have earthquake prone buildings. West Melton Community Park, Reeds Pit, Prebleton Domain. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I was a bit slow getting yeah, on to West Melton Community Park and you sped past but me. Um, again, I questioned the timetable for completion due to the current circumstances. Comment, Douglas? Yeah, no. We probably uh, didn't have a very current update from that contractor. Uh, the project manager has been, I think he's either been in touch or will be in touch this week. We, we are, uh, the report, his report notes, we are two behind, uh, we're behind two other projects. We do want this particular contractor because they are particularly skilled. And as you said earlier in the meeting, Your Worship, when you have problems with certain projects, you learn from them and make sure you don't make them again. So yeah, we're very focused on getting uh, Doing this one absolutely right for us. Thank you. Uh, Prebleton Pump Track, the Liffey Walk and Cycle Extension, uh, Prebleton Intersection Upgrades, or Prebleton Domain, which we've um, and Pump Track have done that year, Prebleton Intersection Upgrades. And that brings us through to the end of this report. Do we have a, a mover and seconder that we receive it? Thank you, Alexander. Seconded Lyle. Sorry, Blance, I should have seen your hand there. Um, any further discussion? All those in favour, please raise your hand. And I have Epaha, McInnes, Reed, Lyle, Hassan, Lemon, Miller, Alexander, Bland, and Gallagher to declare it carried. Thank you, Douglas, uh, for that report. Next up is a transportation uh, monthly update. Um, and the recommendation is that we receive the report. Do I have a mover and seconder for that? Move Reed and Lyle, and welcome Andrew Maisie. Andrew, welcome along to the meeting, uh, and Murray Washington. Uh, and if you'd like to take us through the report, thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I think Murray was going to be conductor and have the report up on the screen. Yes, I have. Oh, great. Thank you very uh, much. Can I just uh, do a, a quick introduction? Thank you, Your Worship and Councillors. Um, this report was written by Andrew and Mark prior to the COVID-19 alert level three 
announcements. So very quickly, some of this has been uh, dated. Um, as the GM property has mentioned, um, as of next Tuesday, there is potential for construction and maintenance activities to commence in full, but that is very much subject to the contractors having their um, health and safety plans revised and accepted by council. So on that basis, uh, I'll just ask Andrew to start working through. I'll scroll down the report and Andrew will make comment where needed. And that's really much on an exception basis. And then we'll take questions whenever you feel fit to ask questions. Thanks, Murray. And can I just ask that you zoom in on your page just so it takes up the full amount of screen that you're sharing uh, with us. Andrew, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I'm just having a few little technical difficulties here, so just bear with me. Is that uh, better both. in terms of zooming? Yes, thank you, Murray. Yeah, no, that, that's all right. I'd lost the screen completely, which was I was starting to panic there for a minute. <laughs> so, all right, thank you very much. Good afternoon again. And um, just starting off, uh, with the first item there in terms of the um, Transport Activity Management Plan. Um, as you see there, we are working on that, as you'd expect um, to inform the next um, LTP process. Um, and we have met with um, NZTA just before everything turned to uh, custard in some re regards and um, discussed with them what their expectations were. I won't go into all the details, but I'll put it to you this way, that uh, money will be tight. We're going to have to work hard for it, even to keep our existing funding level. So uh, we can't underestimate what's um, going to be needed in that respect. Um, work keeps continuing. We, um, as forward later on in the report, you'll see where we've also extended our um, RAM contract or our professional services contract, which feeds in all the asset information into that. Uh, moving on, uh, the um, GPS for transport, the draft. Um, Transport statement has been released for comment. Uh, we're working on that at the moment in terms of putting a draft together. Uh, myself, Rebecca, and we're um, working with Councillor Reid as our council proxy, if you want to put it that way, um, to see that we've got all our um, all our requirements um, represented in there as we need to. Um, it's very much um, following on and an enhancement from the pr previous GPS. Uh, and the sort of strategic objectives they're looking for uh, is in regards to um, safety, better travel options, improving freight connections and um, climate change. So it's not anything really new, it's just, I suppose, shuffling some of the emphasis around. And of course, as you can imagine, we will have plenty to say on all of those, um, those objectives in regards to how it may um, reflect on our situation. And also, I think, obviously, with the current um, crisis in regards to what we may need to think about with that as well. Um, there's a lot of work going in across everybody um, at the moment on um, these submissions and a lot, a lot of cross pollination, if you want to put it that way, in regards to making sure from a regional perspective, we're all um, at least on the same page. Um, Greater Christchurch Transport Partnership. Um, so we've been looking through um, and working on the uh, PT Futures um, business case. And as we had a bit of an email exchange over the last week or so on, some of the, on that regard, and the um, MRT, et cetera. So I won't need to go into that too much more. Um, mode shift plan, um, draft of that has been finalised. NCTA are looking after that. Um, and generally, we've been providing comments um, on um, other aspects in regards to PT and all the other various things that have been going on. Uh, major strategic transport projects, uh, Southern Motorway Extension, actually just about half an hour before I've appeared before you, I got an update from the project manager. And as we would all expect, um, things have been delayed um, in regards to the shutdown. And um, essentially what they're trying to do is get traffic onto the new motorway um, uh, south or uh, towards Christchurch, the, the Christchurch bound lanes. Uh, before winter, they're trying to get that completed at least. But obviously, as we go into the winter season, the wet season, things are going to um, have a big impact on that. And some of the ability to achieve the other works is going to be slowed or halted. So while they were sort of originally trying to get things pretty much wrapped up by the end of this year, um, that's going to likely now extend to the end of the next construction season, i.e. getting into that sort of end of summer um, start of autumn um, in 2021. This is the mirrors basically what's happening with the Christchurch Northern Corridor as well. 
um, and so it's not unexpected in that regard. Um, the project group is still working on the uh, Rolleston State Highway 1 um, project. Um, I haven't heard too much from them lately. Um, I understand that they're still beavering away on it and um, it is seen as an important project um, in terms of from a stimulus perspective. However, having said that, I know there's a lot of pressure within NZTA all over the show on these various um, things. And they may be, and I'm not, I don't know yet, but they may be looking at how they might have to prioritize things going forward over the country. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from them in regards to that. Um, but at the moment, as far as I know, that project's still proceeding as planned. Um, a privileged and intersection upgrades. Um, the team, when I say the team, the staff here, uh, our consultants are involved, have all been working flat out on uh, making sure we're keeping the, the wheels rolling on that, uh, working through our land acquisition aspects. Um, we're also um, working through a game plan on our consenting. Um, and we've also just identified an issue around water races in the area, which we're probably going to have to want to uh, rationalise. And I believe a report's going to perhaps potentially come to you in May uh, in regards to advocating some closures so that we can basically um, you know, make that work happen a bit quicker without needing to get wound up into those existing water races, which are not used now anyway. Um, Broadlands Drive extension, have we skipped a little bit forward? No, that's right. Broadlands Drive um, legalisation, um, good news is, and David be well aware of this, that essentially that um, negotiation has been completed and finalised now with the um, MOE and um, there was a bit of drama trying to get the right signatures on the right bits of paper at the right time at the moment, but um, all, it all looks like it's now um, nailed down. So um, after nine years of work on that between, um, between the teams, it's a, a huge accomplishment to get that thought it out, particularly in these sort of more difficult circumstances. Um, Lease and Dawson Cycleway, um, again, we've now completed and finalised all the land purchase negotiations, um, including site access, and uh, fingers crossed with the work that the team's been doing, the contractor is basically ready to, hopefully ready to go as soon as they can, coming out of lockdown to get into that work as a priority. Obviously with, um, again, the seasons changing, we don't want to be working down there when it's too wet, Nothing too much to report on the Colgate's, Colgate Roads legalisation. We've basically provided information to the committee and residents up there. It was just really pending meeting up with them again, but obviously we can't do that at the moment um, in terms of what's, what's going on. Um, EV charging sites, um, we've got the draft agreements um, back from being legally reviewed and they're back with Orion and ChargeNet on that. And we're just finalising the details on the sites uh, with Orion, so work's continuing on that. Uh, Rolleston Town Centre, um, essentially we're just carrying on where we are at, as we all know we're at at the moment with, with that and things in terms of being delays and what have you. Um, Mark Away um, Dryden project is out for tender at the moment. Um, I believe that's, we've extended the period for that, uh, for those tenders to come in until uh, later in uh, May. Um, obviously, um, tenderers can't get out there to review the site and see what's going on and obviously can't um, compile their um, proposals without knowing or seeing what's out there. Um, the LED um, installation, Dark Skies, you've been um, fully briefed on that through the district plan review um, committee meetings. And as I said, we'll put up these on hold, the rest of the installation during lockdown. Um, one of the First things we were into um, in the lockdown period was um, identifying potential shovel ready projects as they call them and the one the big one that we settled on obviously was the one in regards to um, putting forward a package a, a 13.5 million dollar package of um, road reinstatements associated with rehabs um, um, and um, renewals on our roading network um, that sort of is a, a blend of a backlog that we've already, already, always had, but also just building in that better um, level of service, that resilience that we think we need um, going forward in regards to um, obviously trying to make our economy hum and our transport networks operate as effectively and efficiently as possible. And uh, we will have our fingers crossed that we're successful in that. That entails about 125 kilometres of our network that we're looking to put forward um, for um, funding on that basis. 
I mentioned before about the um, contract 1258, our professional services contract, that's been extended for another two years as we are able to do through the provisions of the, the contract. Um, that's a vital um, contract in terms of um, all the information that's needed to go into our roading and according to the inventory of our roading network, um, condition assessments, analysis, et cetera, to feed into the um, activity management plan to all the requirements that NCTA require and outputs um, in that regard. So um, other than that, the only other one was the, um, just before lockdown, we managed to get squared away with um, the um, CTOP, which the, is the Christchurch Transport Operations Centre, a service level agreement to look after the maintenance and um, running of our traffic signals. As you know, we're um, adding to those all the time at the moment. So it was really important knowing that we had had that confidence going into the, particularly this um, time at the moment that all that aspect was going to be looked after for us. And um, again, it eliminates any problems that we have in trying to manage that situation ourselves directly. Okay, well, that's pretty much it for me. If there are any questions, happy to answer them. Shall we just continue through the report and then we'll come back to any questions uh, at the end. Thanks for that, Andrew. Yep. Mark, are you online? Yep, I'm here. Okay, I'll let Mark take you through to the delivery part of the report. Okay, I'll obviously take most of it as, as read, but obviously uh, for a start, the COVID-19, um, the lockdown has had an impact on what's happening on their construction and traffic activity uh, generally, but um, th that's a bit of a given. Uh, but with corridor um, management, we've appointed a new corridor manager, Tanya Watkins, who was filling in um, for a while uh, and kept on to you know, fill that gap there. She's take, uh, got that role now, so that'll give us a bit more presence out in the field and um, do more, a few more audits, but that hasn't happened over the last uh, four weeks or so. There's just only been a couple of times, but um, that will change a bit. So um, yeah, road maintenance, uh, as we're reporting, um, our expenditure is, is up. We're gonna be um, still forecasting over expenditure for the year. Uh, the work is obviously gonna reduce uh, by the end of the year, just with, um, the reduced work that's been out there with the lockdown, but um, we're well ahead of the game anyway. So um, we're not going to be underspent, um, which some local authorities are, but you know, so we're going to be overspent. But there is that um, essential work that's going out there in terms of edge rate repairs, just for, from a safety point of view and that sort of thing. But we, we weren't doing um, channel clean for a while, but that's been added to now just the leaf form this time of year. We don't want a rain event and have all the channels blocked and that sort of thing. So other than that, all the other work is, um, suspended but hopefully get back up and up and going again once we get into level three and they've got all the health and safety plans in place so they can deal with that separation and that sort of thing so uh, yep carry on down um unsealed roads assessment so so this is an update from the previous one and um i've got we've got four inspection around inspection uh, data now so uh, this is just a wee, wee snippet of it but i'll probably in the next report i'll give more detail and a breakdown on the different work and where the issues are um the assessments have shown that the network, unseen network overall is deteriorated over those um, over the last two years, which isn't a surprise given that we're always saying we have got enough funding for it and things like that, but it sort of gives a bit of a, um, a, a picture of where we're going in a trend. But the longer the trend goes, the more of it we'll see and um, sort of depends what happens with whether um, any extra funding, um, if that shovel ready projects include some maintenance beetling or unsealed rehabs and that, then that may make a difference as well. And so, so maybe questions on what's happened on this, but I've got more data at, uh, at the, the next meeting and which gives a bit more detail on that. So um, what are we going? Rehab program. So I've finished all the um, the rehabs. I th I thought the Booters Road one was uh, just out of uh, Lincoln was getting ready for sale. I thought they just missed out, but they got it done the last day. So they managed to get in there and tied out. But still got some um, tidy up to do, but um, it, it was quite a good timing. They only just got it done in time. So it was on the on the Wednesday, I think they finished it. So uh, carry on down, Murray. Just a couple of photos there for us. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the, the top one is Ward's Road. The one on the right is Ward's Road, just before ceiling. And the one on the bottom left is Birch's Road. They're just doing some testing, getting the final preparation of ceiling. So, yep. Uh, carry on down, Capital Works. Um, yeah, just an update on these. Yeah, obviously, the um, work hasn't been done in the last last month. So, um, but they 
uh, less endorsed in cycleway. Uh, the, the contractor is uh, is ready to go. Um, any work that's going to get up on, well, as long as the contractor has got their um, health and safety plans updated so they can uh, deal with um, separation of their staff, um, using the gear, make sure it's wiped down, that sort of thing, and have those processes in place. Uh, once they've got that approved, then um, we will be underway. But they do need, need to have that before they can get going. It's not a matter of just starting. They do need to have that all approved. And so that applies to um, all of these, really. So uh, the last one, the Lincoln Tidy Recycle, we, we did have a tender, um, but just with the uncertainty of when they could actually start and finish and things like that, it was different to, to the document put out. So we did withdraw it, but we're just going to work on that now with a bit more certainty on what's happening over the next couple of weeks, and we'll get that out to the market again. Just avoid having too many tags and things like that coming in with the tenders, having to deal with those. Um, High Street Southbridge, again, that's a project that will... Uh, they'll get underway again once they get back. And Duns Crossing Road, Seal Extension, Robinson Road, Seal Extension, um, we've been, there's been delay um, with the, the final sealing job there that needs a repair. Um, it was going to be done the sealing season, but the, they haven't got around to doing that or had put their submission and get it approved to get done. So that'll have to wait till the next season now. So um, that's okay. It's still operating perfectly okay. It just needs an improvement to the seal there. Um, yeah, and again, the traffic signal. So we'll get underway with that. Once they're able to, uh, Walker's Road, that's in for funding, so we're getting it ready, but um, need to have the funding available. And the last one, road safety update. Uh, so we've got Jessica's um, in the new uh, road safety education coordinator's role. So um, she's doing, the timing um, was great, so it was a week before we went to lockdown. So. She hasn't been in the office, much staff interaction and that sort of thing, and just totally new to the role. But um, she's been doing a lot of research, keeping in touch with um, our school road safety coordinator and also um, regional road safety coordinators as well. So she's getting a lot of information, um, bouncing around ideas, but working on a winter campaign, uh, working with the, the comms team. So getting things underway um, and we'll start getting, we're still going to be at home for a while yet, yeah, working remotely. So. Uh, between them they're actually getting the campaigns underway and ordering work and so we do the media and get stuff underway and, and stuff in the local papers so um still working on it but it was you know, chucked in the deep end of it with not much help around but um there's, she's had good assistance from um, other staff who, who had the experience and things like that and also regionally so i think that's about it thanks for that mark murray are there any concluding comments before we move into questions from councillors well, just yes, it's been a difficult period with the COVID-19. Um, we were fortunate that um, obviously the maintenance was considered essential services. We've got through to four weeks without any particular issues. We haven't had any big rainfall events or anything. The weather's been quite settled through the last month, so that's been a bonus. So uh, we'll continue to update the report each month, and as uh, Mark said, at the next meeting, we'll do a wee bit more deeper analysis into the uh, road conditions, particularly the unsealed road conditions. Uh, other than that, I'll just be any questions of Andrew, Mark or myself. Thank you. If you want to just stop screen sharing, Murray, and then we'll be able to see everyone on screen and we've got the papers within our agendas too. I wonder if, first of all, we'll just have questions for or comments around the first half of the report for Andrew, and then we'll move on to the second half of the report. And um, rather than each question being responded to uh, in turn, Andrew, I guess you've got a pen and paper there. I uh, just thinking we'll just provide some feedback to you and then at the end you can respond uh, to all of it. So just firstly from me, uh, there's been some questions around public transport charging uh, and the future of that space. Um, has there been any, any discussion at a staff level between ourselves and, and ECAN and the other in Christchurch and um, Waimaku area about how public transport charging um, might look in the future? Um, if you can give us an update on that. Uh, when you look at the Christchurch Southern Motorway extension, uh, CSM2, um, we've obviously been aware that the Northern Motorway uh, has had delays, um, much more significant than ours had. Just wanting to, to make sure that we don't end up in a space where they, they end up taking resource um, away from the completion of our Southern Motorway. Uh, and just to keep to catch up uh, the Northern side of things, and I don't know if you've had those discussions with NZTR and their staff, but very keen that we don't play second fiddle to that northern, uh, the northern option. Um, it's great to hear that the Rolleston State Highway 1 corridor improvements project is um, still on track. That $60 million is um, key for us to deliver the expectations for our community through that space. So good to hear that's um, still going on. And that the Broadlands Road, um, Broadlands Drive, sorry, agreement is finally getting to that concluded stage and we might end up seeing 
some development of the um, residential area that's left there um, in the near future once that's um, sorted out from the Ministry of Education side. Um, EV charging sites has been mentioned, definitely support getting them in, uh, particularly it's through the Alpine roads um, and, and want to see uh, that done. There's obviously been an increase in the EV take up across uh, the country and if we're going to come out of this uh, with a more environmental um, concern and the government has said that's where they want to be putting their money is around the social and environmental outcomes and us playing our part in supporting uh, those charging stations is, is going to be key. Uh, when we looked at the bright lights um, LED installation, uh, there has been some commentary back from Castle Hill around lighting that has gone in. Uh, it's a new LEDs that is quite different uh, and changing the night sky considerably up there and just thinking about what we're trying to do uh, for a dark sky reserve in that space. Um, any any work that you have uh, on plans to rectify or change what's going on there and what might happen for lights, um, particularly Castle Hill and Arthur's Pass uh, going forward. And um, I'll leave it there and hand over to any other councillors who have got comments. Uh, I'll deal with the blue hands uh, first and Councillor Murray Lemon. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Just mindful of um, Mark's comments that there'll be a, a, an up rated report on the unsealed road maintenance. So I'll, I'll defer that. I guess I'll, what I will say, uh, or the question to Andrew, and he may not be able to answer this now, and it may be that it comes back to us in, in next month's report, but how much of that 13.5 million application for shovel ready is around that unsealed road maintenance? Because it, it doesn't make great reading, as, as we're all aware, there's, there's no surprises there. And at a time when we're reliant on our, our primary industries to uh, being assisting us out of out of what's a very difficult time, and they are one of the consistent earners for us as an income going forward uh, when uh, uh, other industries such as um, tourism was devastated. Uh, if I was in that industry, I'd be particularly miffed at having to still drive on a road that's increasingly deteriorating. And I know it's something that we will hear a lot about at annual plan and long-term plan. So um, not expecting an answer, just making the point that um, I look forward to seeing that. We've also got a road maintenance contract coming up due in the near future and it'll be a point of discussion there too, I'm, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Alexander. Thank you. My question was to Andrew, was if he could further elaborate on his comments about funding being reduced. Is that funding for future projects rather than our existing um, funding within the current GPS? Cool, and any further questions for Andrew? Uh, Councillor Miller. Um, want to support Murray, um, did a large work project through audit and risk um, the last term where we looked at gravel roads and um, the data tends to support what our ratepayers have been telling us for a long time is that rural gravel roads are not up to scratch. We as a council have made um, quite a decision that we're not going to sell any more roads and we all have bought into that. But the proviso of that was that if we're going to have gravel roads, we'll have them as good as we possibly could. And clearly the data is telling us now that a, it's not, and B, it's getting worse. So um, that leads on to um, the issue that we're facing and our chief executive is facing. We're already 20% overspending our roading budget this year. If we're going to try and provide some remedy to these people or to provide some assistance, uh, trying to have a 0% rates increase or even um, un under three and a half is going to be a struggle for the chief executive. So um, it's one of those things where I'd rather be in my shoes than the chief executives, but Clearly, we need to signal to our ratepayers that, hey, if you're going to have cuts in rates, um, it's got to be cut in services too somewhere along the way. So that's just the reality of it. So, um, but I do feel for our, particularly our gravel roading uh, consumers, but um, particularly thanks for giving the update on the Lincoln Tide Apu Cycleway, uh, there's a large portion of the community who are really anxious to see that go ahead. So it's good to hear that you're going to put that uh, back on the track, but I was concerned about some of the overspend being about road maintenance and getting it ready to, to, to before it is resealed. Um, particularly Councillor Hassan and I, myself have been concerned about the level of deterioration on Gerald Street in Lincoln and the continual patching of that. And I suppose the analogy is, is that we're probably all around the table have one of those cars in life where you consistently have it at the garage and keep throwing costs at it and it come, the, the realisation dawns one time that you don't throw a further dollar out, you get a new one or get a better second-hand one. And I think we might be in that place in a number of our roads throughout Selvin where 
and I hope this 13 and a half million package comes through because there are significant portions of road which do urgently need rehabilitation. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for Andrew? Andrew, if you'd like to respond to any of those matters that you feel you can, and then we'll move on to the um, uh, to Mark Chamberlain as part of the report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just in regards to your comment about PT charging, um, the PT futures business case that's going on at the moment doesn't necessarily get into that realm of charging um, and fare structure. But having said that, um, with the sort of the issues that have been identified as we're working through the business case, it's becoming more and more evident that some wider lateral thinking needs to be applied to this issue. And so um, I can't really say much more than that at the moment, but it's certainly been identified by a lot of people that this needs to be somehow brought into the equation. So I'm fully on board with your comments on that, but you'll just have to watch that, watch the space on that in terms of seeing how that will evolve. Um, yeah, in terms of CSM2 and resourcing, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I, can be, I can be very confident to say, I don't believe there's going to be an issue with resource poaching. Um, there's independent, you know, separate contractors for each project. Um, I know as again, when I talked to the project manager or he emailed me this afternoon, um, he's got problems where his resources are out of the region and at the moment he can't get them into the region. And some of those resources that he had that perhaps were overseas workers um, have now gone back home. And so there's some gaps that need to be filled in regards to how you know, uh, the resources are brought in on those projects. But I don't think there's an issue with, as I said, um, poaching, if you want to put it that way. Um, Broadlands Drive, yep, thank you very much. Um, it's good that we've got that there. Um, development of that area, um, well, part of the deal that we struck with the MOE was a re requirement to pay development contributions when that land is <coughs> developed in the future, which is part and parcel of the deal. Um, it'll all just depend when the MOE wishes to um, um, sell that land off and somebody then develops it. When they will do that, who knows, but the provision's all there to enable that, um, that to be captured at that time. Um, EV charging, yep, fully on board with your comments there, and it's very much in the forefront of our minds and the Energy, energy um, Commission as well in regards to working with us on those projects to get them in sooner rather than later. Um, Castle Hill, that's a, the lighting there, that's an interesting one, that was one of the first um, areas that we replace the LED lights in, and we actually went down to the lower um, temperature rating on those. The problem was is that the um, there were very decorative lights that were there to start with, and we tried to replicate the that aspect in regards to what we replaced them with. But you trade off what looks nice nice against what is most effective in regards to managing um, light spill and, and that type of things, and it's a good example on why those two aren't necessarily complementary. So when and if we get into that dark skies accreditation aspect and having to look at replacing the lights and the likes of Arthur's Pass and Castle Hill and things like that, we'll no doubt be doing it in a different way or looking at it in a different way to make sure that those um, aspects are, are accounted for. Interestingly, the last time I left it with the Castle Hill people was as we'd identified there were quite a number of lights that had been installed in private right of ways, which don't usually happen and council does not usually maintain them. Um, and we put it back to them to say, well, look, um, if you want to improve and have less lights, well, in, in rights, we've actually got the ability to, or should have the ability to take those lights away on the private right of way. So the ball was a little bit back in their court on that one, but it's a, it's a good, interesting little area just to sort of um, try and understand how the dynamics of these things work and applied on a bigger scale. Um, the, uh, I think that was pretty much it for you, Sam. Um, for Councillor Murray, unsealed maintenance. Um, yeah, well, part of the shovel ready um, um, initiative or package that we put forward, um, Murray, was um, very much around um, work on the unsealed rehabs. So basically, on the sealed network, rehabs were around 23 kilometres. AC works were around 12 kilometres, and there was 90 kilometres associated with doing rehabs on the unsealed network. And so that gave a total of about 125 Ks that we put forward for this um, initiative. I've, we very much um, emphasize the point in that submission um, on the fact that we want to have our unsealed and rural roading networks to a, a standard that will support, um, you know, primary industry, the agriculture that's going on in there, the ability or the need to make sure that we've got 
um, getting from farm gate to, to market in the best way possible going forward um, in regards to our contribution to getting out of this crisis. So if we can pull this off in regards to getting that funding, it will go a very long way to um, not only bring all, um, those areas of the, the roads, unsealed roads up to a better standard, it will then take the burden off that aspect so we can use that the funding, our existing funding, if you want to put it that way, to do the more regular maintenance, metalling and grading and things like that, as opposed to that works being a burden. So I hope that, as I say, hope we can pull that off. Um, in regards to the um, uh, Mark, Mark Alexander's comp question about funding reduction, um, uh, Mark, that was along the lines of the fact that um, we get funded by the NZTA in three year blocks. As you know, it's a bit like the, the current um, LTP every three year cycle. So last time round, we managed to get quite a big um, increase in our, in our funding allocation, which was all good. Um, but as I said to you before, um, the advice by the NZTA is, is that we'll have to work hard to keep that um, and or increase on it. Um, so uh, it's, it's not just projects, it's the whole realm of our transport activities from everywhere from road maintenance to those CapEx projects. Um, but as I said, we'll just have to put the hard yards in and um, make sure that we get our best foot forward. Um, in regards to uh, Grant's comments about unsealed roads, I think we've, I've talked about that too. Um, it is very much about you as a council determining what levels of service you want to provide. I'll, you've probably heard me say this before, but our unsealed network is the least used part of our roading network over the whole district. And you've got to weigh up if what level of investment you want to put into that in relation to the amount of use that it gets. It's, it's a fundamental question. And I remember back in the day when I first started with council before all the fancy KPIs and this, that and everything else, our, our level of service objective for unsealed roads was pretty simple. It was pretty much like, can you drive a standard um, sedan down an unsealed road at 70 kilometres an hour safely and, and, and not get into any problems? And so it's going from that sort of um, very basic perspective to seeing what else is a, an appropriate level of service um, that you may wish to, to hone in on. Um, and I think that was pretty much all. Oh, the only other thing is, is the, um, I'll just touch on Grant's comment about Gerald Street and the, the rehabs and what have you. Again, um, with work that's been going on on shovel ready projects, I've been talking to the NZTA about um, potentially I'm trying to see if we can get leverage funding or more funding through them for the Rolleston Town Centre works, um, but also for the Lincoln Town Centre and very much along pushing that line that we have got a pavement there that's um, um, in some distress, that it would be good to get onto this sooner rather than later in context with the whole Town Centre upgrade. Um, so again, we don't know where this is going to land in terms of where they may come back to us in regards to the assessment of all these showery projects but you can be assured from that perspective, at least we're trying to, I'm trying to push that aspect. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for all those responses. Um, and Mark, thank you for what you've um, provided us uh, in the report. It was really great to see the, the sweepers out on the road uh, uh, during autumn time. And I know that there has been a concern in the past about just ensuring that uh, gutters were clear for, should there be a heavy rainfall. Um, weather's pretty good today and for the next week, which, is, um, which has been nice. Uh, I guess the big thing is the, the graphs that are there and um, the trend downwards, which you've mentioned, there'll be some extra reporting for uh, next week, which will actually be in a couple of weeks time. Um, there'll be no meeting um, next week, uh, three weeks time actually. Uh, but just looking at, uh, the, the, I guess the fundamental question for us to all consider and for you to think uh, and staff, other roading staff for us is what level of funding is gonna be required in the LTP uh, for that trend to be reversed um, at some point it'll plateau, they're not going to continually get better and better and better um, at the same rate, but we do want that turned around um, and for you to put in front of us, I'm sure it'll be a challenging number um, and particularly considering that the uh, roading costs uh, covered out of the general rate um, and a greater proportion of that is covered by the large landholders and rural ratepayers, which will mean their rates would be um, substantially increased above what the average rate might be across the district should we increase the road funding. Um, but yeah, a proposal to turn that around in the LTP is certainly expected. Um, and we look forward to the extra work that's going to be in the report, uh, the extra data, sorry, in the report uh, still to come. Councillors, is there 
uh, further comments you would like to make or questions that you have for um, for Mark Chamberlain? There not been any. Um, have we had a mover and seconder for the report? No, is someone happy to move that we, um, Lemon and Gallagher? All those in favour, please raise your hand. And I see Epeha, McInnes, Reed, Alexander, Hassan, Bland, Gallagher, um, Miller, Lemon, Lyle. Uh, thank you very much to clear that carried. Um, Murray and staff, thank you for that report. Uh, comprehensive and um, yeah, look forward to receiving uh, the next one too. Councillors, that brings us to the end of the public agenda. David, there's nothing else in the public um, agenda space that you need um, discussed or would like to highlight to us now. You're on uh, mute there, David. I'm sorry, um, the answer was no, there's not. Do I have a, a mover and a seconder that we move into public excluded? Thank you, Councillor Alexander and Councillor Reid. Uh, all those in favour, uh, please raise your hands. And I have Epeha, McInnes, Reid, Alexander, Lyle, Gallagher, Bland, Hassan, Lemon and Miller. Declare it carried. Uh, and we'll adjourn the meeting now for 20 minutes. Uh, join back at uh, 4.10. And I want to thank any of the public that have been uh, watching today's meeting. Thank you for joining us. I trust that uh, you've been able to follow along with the discussion um, and we look forward to hearing your submissions um, through the annual plan out for consultation today. Kia ora. Thanks everyone.